If you were to argue in 2007 that Stalker would become a ferociously beloved game, it'd be an uphill fight. But here we are, where a single developer has set up to create their own top-down Stalker love letter, and it turns out pretty good, as Tunguska The Visitation. Released fully in 2021, and receiving a handful of expansions since, it's more than just a Unity hack job, offering dozens of hours of exploration, storytelling, and survival action gameplay. Although none of these components stand alone, put together they make up a decent RPG that wouldn't be out of place from the 2000s. Except instead of a janky Eastern European game, you've got a janky Western one. Tunguska doesn't waste any time getting the ball rolling. Set in the 1980s, you play as a New York reporter who's tasked to investigate the titular region of the Soviet Union after rumours arise about monsters, powerful serums, and otherworldly events occurring. As soon as you arrive, you make contact with a bunch of bootleggers and ghoul hunters, one of the game's factions. These opening hours almost replicate your time in the rookie village in the first Stalker. You learn the basics of combat, stealthing, trading, and crafting. There's even a version of Sidorovich in the form of Sador, who also carries around a piece of chicken. After this, you ingratiate yourself with the Cossacks, a paramilitary organization trying to stake out the territory against the local military and Chechen warlords. Eventually, the focus becomes acquiring stat-boosting serums harvested from the zone, this game's version of artifacts, and in particular a cure to the Tunguska Syndrome, which is responsible for mutating the previous settlers of the region. The real-world Tunguska region itself certainly holds mystic qualities since the 1908 meteor event, and the idea that the Soviets were experimenting with uncontrollable forces or that it would become a Wild West of sorts feels believable, much like the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. There's a nice variety of disused settlements, industrial sites, swamps, train stations, and Soviet iconography where various anomalies occupy, all overlaid by nice ambient music and noises depending on time of day. Scouring a disused camp or tunnel that's pitch black will keep you on edge, and the proper usage of quiet time allows you to soak it all in. However, unlike other RPGs, your interaction with the world is very restrained. There are a variety of factions, but you can't pick sides nor change any outcome. This is basically demonstrated in one of the first quests where you're tasked to clear out some bandits from a distillery. Talking with their leader indicates you can either attack them or pay them to leave. Attacking them leads to a difficult firefight. Paying them off still leads to the same firefight, but now you've lost all your money. There's only hostile and non-hostile NPCs. Actually attacking any of the latter leads to a main quest failure prompt and a reload. You can boost your relationship with factions by completing deliveries and side quests, although I'm not sure what the benefit is. Item prices seem unchanged. I think it expands the areas they occupy, making backtracking safer. The restrictions go further. The world is connected through different large maps you can only unlock by completing the main quest in a linear fashion. This all makes sense, even the most well-funded studios struggle to create functioning quest lines and dynamic factions. It just means you can't explore as freely. Good, satisfying progression, I think, is invaluable in any RPG that isn't a forever game. So Tunguska railroading you down one route is fine as long as the gameplay and writing holds up. Speaking of, it's better than bad. There's a good dozen or so characters you'll interview with a barrage of questions detailing their background and beliefs. These range from purely adventurism, a second chance at life, or trying to use the serums to help people. There's a few who take time before trusting you and that have unique connections to the land. I think the storytelling isn't very unique besides badly inserted fourth wall breaks of fake news, stalker references, and very stale memes interrupting the flow of conversation. However, the game avoids making the plentiful dialogue boring or too wordy. For once, this level of artistic inquiry is justified by being a reporter as your stories are then relayed back to your office in New York. Wait a second, why is a supposed reporter able to use firearms, catch and cook food, patch up injuries, and confidently kill plenty of people? For the same reason your character's occupation is listed as game developer. I feel it's the limitations of consistent writing and goofy inserts. Your character's actual involvement in the story is almost superfluous. You don't make any major impact on the world except for a couple characters that slightly alter the ending. Again, despite killing hundreds of militia and monsters, you're just in Tunguska for a couple of months to write a few articles. You'd expect the usual trope of contracting the Tunguska Syndrome and now unable to return home. Not at all. It's just a status debuff you can remove with one of the many craftable serums. You can even call up your boss in New York and whine about how dangerous everything is. I assume the lack of a consequential storyline is so the setting can be expanded upon through the expansions or a potential sequel. After tens of hours of surviving, the ending is a little bit uneventful, barely containing any surprises. Playing Tunguska is much more interesting, with its mixture of immersive survival and challenging combat mechanics. At first, the fixed isometric perspective is a little clunky. 
you move around either with WSAD or mouse clicking, which also picks up items. If you're struggling to find something, you can highlight all interactable objects. Pulling out your weapon switches to an aiming mode, your mouse becoming a crosshair to fire with. This differs slightly if you use melee weapons. You then strafe left or right and click to swing your weapon. The only problem was aiming at close range being very ornery, even when using a shotgun. Exploring buildings and interiors is enabled by a cutting diorama view. After a while of altering between these controls, it becomes an effective control scheme. While working on this review, recent updates have added different control modes. I'm not sure about their applicability, but the added effort is commendable. Inventory management will take up a lot of your time because of very strict space limits in the beginning. It follows a grid tile set and you'll frequently have to rearrange your gear. The game doesn't explicitly tell you, but any container will retain your items. At least they did for me, so it's no problem storing excess baggage early on. There's also weight capacity, but only in the very late game did it matter when you're logging around the heaviest weapons. You can expand inventory space by either finding or buying satchels at exorbitant prices. The UI is pretty good, everything is laid out as it should be. Entering your menu has the usual tab list of journal entries, items, quest lines, and options. There's also skills, but unless you have the Way of the Hunter DLC, it's barred off. Following quests is pretty simple, as every update is logged, and important NPCs don't wander around, nor can they die. However, there aren't the usual on-screen waypoints for the maps. Sometimes you're given a single picture to work off, or have to memorize safe pathways. It's a more hardcore decision that ramps up the danger of getting lost, isolated, and finally whittled down by the environment. Tunguska has pretty deep survival mechanics that persistently challenge you. While walking around, you'll notice a precipitous decline in your energy bar which affects your stamina pool and health regeneration when sleeping. This is declining near constantly and food can restore it. Food is commonly found off dead enemies, trading NPCs, and various loot boxes. The usual canned tuna and flatbread can be instantly eaten, but potatoes and raw meat have to be cooked up first. Cooking is a lot more involved than just finding a campfire. You have to adjust the heat levels and add the proper fuel and ingredients, otherwise it's just an edible mush. I rarely bothered with it. What would you prefer? Hunting down and cooking up a meal, or just buying some grub from a local trader and getting back to work? Wait, is that just modern living? Okay, I'm not lazy. I can cook just as good as the dev. I'm inspired by the best and learn from the rest. I'm stopping the review now. Here, I call it Selican's Kibble. Grab some carrots, garlic, onions, pip some olives. Steam the carrots and peas and start making rice. Heat up your large pan, then add in the garlic and onions. Now add in the vegetables, chicken, pork, or in my case, corn. After a bit, put in red kidney beans and stir before adding in several diced tomatoes or tin tomatoes. Keep at a medium heat for about 20 minutes, stirring occasionally. Adding a bit of water, and there you have it, Selican's Kibble. Well, that was nice. What aren't are the anomalies which will kill the shit out of you if you cross their path. They're mostly just kill zones in a fixed area that you can detect with a device or throwing rocks to find their path. There's only a few types in the main game. It would have been nice if their placement was randomized a bit, as after your first time through, they're easy to avoid. There are some benign anomalies that can repair equipment, and I like this environmental interaction, I just wish there was more of it. Visitation events are much more hazardous. Functioning like emission blowouts in Clear Sky and Pripyat, they occasionally occur, and if you don't take cover, you'll likely die outright. Although, if you have some level of the Tunguska Syndrome, you'll be cured of it. Protecting you is a decent arsenal of Soviet-era firepower. Pistols, shotguns, rifles, and SMGs with standard and armor-piercing rounds. It has that classic foible of early guns being rubbish despite using the same ammo as the later tier, which themselves suddenly become plentiful, making the mid-tier guns kind of worthless. Weapon attachments can be interchangeably applied, except I rarely found them besides the laser sight. It so greatly improved my accuracy that I had it on for the entire game. It should require batteries to recharge. Gun jamming is rare, as maintaining your gear is simple, either use a repair kit or combine two of the same weapons at a workbench. You can craft ammo, but I never invested much into, in due part to the limited inventory space. Aside from guns, there are melee weapons which are effective against ghouls, but basically useless against live humans. There's also body armors and a few different explosive items like grenades and mines for flushing out enemies or setting ambushes. These are important because of the tactical edge to combat. As even with these weapons, Tunguska is often a difficult game. There's a bevy of enemies from bandits, rogue soldiers, wolves, and mutants. At first mindless zombies, then heavily armored brutes. Enemies have a detection cone that once alerted will aggressively charge, flank, and overwhelm your meager hit points. 
You'll have plenty of tough and intense firefights, ducking between cover to take aim, and desperately switching to melee when surrounded. The AI isn't exactly clever though. Monsters will just charge straight at you, and it's common seeing hostile grenades blow up their own side. The low actual field of view stunts engagements somewhat. Absent a sniper rifle, you can't see very far ahead, but NPCs can. Too often I'd be running before suddenly entering into combat. It's something that wouldn't happen if you could detect enemies ahead sooner. As long as you have enough healing items and ammo, it's not that hard, except for when the late game features utterly rubbish RNG mutant spawns that toss fireballs, stunning and blowing you the fuck up. Death sends you back to your last save, usually at a bed or a campsite if you're packing a sleeping bag. That was until a recent update added quick saving. It makes sense, although it should be relegated to an easy mode. The cost and resources when fighting and frequency of dying make setting traps or outright avoidance through stealth a very viable option. Obviously better at night, if you stay crouched, watch for the noise indicator of enemies moving, observe their patrol patterns and throw rocks to distract them, you can confidently slink past them or whittle down the defenses. You can attach silences to some guns or approach them from behind and choke them out with a rope. You have to hold down the mouse button until the animation completely finishes or you'll just stop and awkwardly stand around. It's really satisfying wiping out a camp full of highly armed brigands one by one without wasting any ammo or health. Of course, this doesn't apply to packs of ghouls, just hope you've got enough stamina left to outrun them. Despite the danger, you'll need to fight a lot of monsters, not just to progress, but obtain ingredients for the ever essential serums. These can restore health, reduce radiation and Tunguska syndrome, buff your damage and stamina, and if you track down rare recipes, permanently increase your stats. Brewing up serums requires a serum lab, fuel like gas and wood, the correct selection of ingredients and heat level. Keeping track of this can be confusing, thankfully there's recipes for reference, and with a recipe book it becomes easy to whip up some Russian heroin. Ingredients are derived from the several endemic plants across the zone and looted mutant parts, best acquired in melee combat. Excess serums can be sold to factions for large sums of money and boosting your reputation. I feel this is one of the strongest features of Tunguska. Not only does it make narrative sense, it intersects with the various exploration and combat mechanics. Killing enemies efficiently and exploring the wilderness for the correct plants is a consistent gameplay loop. Serums don't suddenly become redundant, Unlike the artifacts in Stalker, they were more like companions rather than the focus of the game. Perhaps the only notable drawback is you can harvest nearly all your resources around a couple areas, this swamp in particular. Quite a few areas don't offer anything exclusively, and absent a larger number of side quests, you'll explore them only once. The greatest surprise of playing Tunguska was the overall small number of bugs for a project this large by a sole developer. It never crashed, nothing broke, items didn't disappear or not work, questlines then lock up, and the performance remains steady throughout. I can't say if it was the skill of the programmer, ample testing, or the Unity engine being properly optimized. Either way, not feeling constantly anxious of the whole experience breaking was very pleasant. This leaves the significant faults and nitpicks few in number, however noticeable. The difficulty is consistent, aside from the occasional bullshit mob or landmine, until a mandatory escape scenario at a disused asylum. Stealthy in Tunguska is fine because of it being optional, Having to play ball with a balked alert system across a whole bunch of trial and error attempts that can easily softlock you was not fun. It's not like there's any major plot attached, it's just something that happens bludgeoning the pace up to that point. A much less irritating yet consistent problem will be how trading and money is managed. All NPCs trade highly priced stuff and will pay a premium for goods they lack, encouraging you to scavenge the maps and enemies for everything except that limited inventory space severely inhibits looting, and the time taken to earn enough to expand it is a soul-crushing experience. Funnily enough, because bullets are far more valuable than the guns themselves, an unintentional mechanic emerges. More so than the Metro games, stealthing and conserving ammo is a useful investment. An odd feature is how fast travelling between settlements cost a fortune initially, and then suddenly becomes affordable. I thought it might be tied to your relationship with the faction, but I have no idea, it just made backtracking mandatory early on when you have no cash. Your austere lifestyle ends once you start getting notified about caches, a la stalkers stashes. Except these contain randomly generated loot, some of it really useful, like body armor and inventory expansions. Now consider that it's randomized whenever you open it up and you might realize an opportunity. Just keep reloading saves until you get a nice score and fully max out your inventory space. Their frequency means that outside of food and meds, there's not a huge necessity to trade stuff. 
these outline problems can easily be ironed out and the devs consistency for adding quality of life enhancements and responsiveness to feedback goes well beyond the usual jerry-rigging of buggy code and bold design. In fact, another bunch of updates were released as I was writing up the script. This ongoing dedication makes the added DLC all the more surprising and impressive. I focused on Ravenwood stories, which covers another area of Tunguska where some military vets have encamped but are now at loggerheads over how to acquire potential serum to cure PTSD. The dialogue and characterization is much deeper, where shared ideals clash with differing ethics. There's a strong libertarian bent to the goings-on of Tunguska's communities, but it's not overbearing. Ravenwood Stories explores the issues of delegating authority and banal tasks in such communities like cooking, farming, and crafting, mechanics which take a more prominent role here than in the base game. There's more weapons, enemies, anomalies, obscure RPG references, and an unlockable house. There's even more weirdness. A strange cult dominates the surroundings, which, after careful analysis, I think is an allegory for insuldom or monogamy. No, no, seriously, there's a complicated sexual dynamic at play that the cult's leader employs to control the locals. It's certainly an original storyline, all things considered. It's a good expansion, actually reminds me a bit of Fallout's Point Lookout or the following in Dying Light, and for about 5 bucks, it's a solid deal. One of the other DLCs, The Way of the Hunter, I'm not so sure about. It adds in character creation and skills you can apply at, making the constant EXP gains worth something. I think basic character creation shouldn't require paid DLC, even at a low price. Nevertheless, what we've got here is a derivative yet very well made indie title that will hopefully and deservedly become a cult classic. I mark it as a good, at times great game. The dev is clearly highly talented in tightly wrapping up the various mechanics into a neat package. I recommend playing Tunguska The Visitation, at least so the dev gets more support and expands the setting in their future work because they've certainly demonstrated the capabilities well beyond most in the field. Now, I'm hungry and gonna cook some more.